why do I do mathematics? At this point, because I can't stop. <laughs> and um, why did I start doing mathematics? I, I didn't plan to, but um, because it's uh, beautiful, because I want to understand things, uh, and because it's uh, very satisfying that you can find an answer, uh, a precise answer, and that you can communicate easily with other mathematicians. Yes, so my research <coughs> is uh, between algebra, abstract algebra, and uh, topology. So algebra is abstract version of, uh, of arithmetic or something, of calculating. And topology is a very abstract version of space. And um, these are considered kind of two main directions of mathematics, say even all the time, or, uh, since the Greeks even. Uh, but very often in mathematics, what makes things really work is that we can translate between the two. And interestingly enough, in logic, which is, seems to be neither algebraic nor uh, spatial, actually uh, the two come together in some quite perfect form where you have a duality and everything translates from the algebraic side to the topological side and vice versa in a perfect way so that every question can be studied from the two sides. And this is what I find very exciting. Actually, I, I went to an elementary school in uh, Algeria, in French school, in the late 60s, early, early 70s, 1970s. And this was right when there was the experiment of new math, of abstract math. And, um, and so I was a product of that. And this, I think this is actually why I became a mathematician, because it was not a great success. It was not viewed as a great success, but for me, it was amazing. So in first grade, we learned to do addition and multiplication. But for each problem, it was given which base. And we did every base between 2 and 11. And we especially loved 11, because then we got to make our symbol Ourself, one symbol ourselves. Uh, and it wasn't until second grade that we were told, oh, by the way, in this culture at this time, we use base 10. Uh, apart from that, we did functions, we did binary operations, we had to check for commutativity or absorbing elements or see whether the function was injective, subjective, things like that. So this was, this was the math we had in the first years of school, and I loved it. Then later in high school, I went to Danish school, and their math is just handmaiden of physics. And so this I was not very happy with. And I got much more interested in history and art and things like that. But then for university, I went to the US, and I happened to be in, in, in Texas. And I fell under the spell of Texas topologists, and they make you rediscover mathematics from scratch. And then I completely fell in love with math and I stopped doing art. <laughs> so this is kind of my progression through uh, to get to mathematics. Yes, yeah, so in terms of uh, big mathematical moments um, in my life, uh, I would say the, f the first one was while I was working with Bjarne Janssen, who is uh, an Icelandic mathematician, actually, but who worked in the US. Um, we were trying to understand uh, stone duality. So this is a duality between lattices, which is like the basic structure of logic in terms of and and or and the spatial version of it, which has spectral spaces. Okay? We're trying to understand, th this is what I was saying earlier, that, that these two worlds, which are 
geometric in style and algebraic, they are actually equivalent. So you can translate across this. And so if you have a logical system, you usually have conjunction and disjunction, which gives you a lattice, but you also have lots of other operations. And so you want to understand these operations on the spatial side. And uh, Janssen and Tarski uh, wrote some papers in the 50s that, uh, where, where, they, where they did this in an algebraic form. And, um, and we were trying to, to understand it better because it's in fact very, very difficult theory because things don't compose well. So, um, and one time I was visiting him in this cottage in northern Minnesota, and we had just realized that the way to move an operation from the algebraic side to the spatial side was through putting topology on the algebra, essentially a lower and upper semi-continuous envelopes of the algebraic operation. And Bjarni had worked on this his whole life. This was in, this was like in uh, the late 90s, okay? And he had done this work with, with Tarski in the 40s. And I didn't really notice, but my husband noticed that Bjarni stood and looked at a tree from this far away for about two days. And kept going, this can't be right. It can't be right. And, and it, was, it was just such a fundamental discovery that just came to us in one moment there in the middle of the nature for no good reason and that had such broad consequences for how the whole theory worked um, that it, it, was, it was an amazing moment. And it, it ended up, you know, the... the to get a bit technical, the, the thing is that the extension depends on a different topology on the domain and the codomain. And this means that when you compose, it's not necessarily continuous in the composition. And so then you get a very complicated theory. But it explained why it's complicated in a very simple form. So this, this was a very exciting moment. Well, so uh, I have traveled a lot as a child. I lived a lot of different places. And um, I realized how hard it is to communicate because people locally, people that stay in one place, they all have a bunch of, they have a whole culture in common. And they think something is completely normal and you don't see it as normal. And so you have a different point of view and it can actually be very hard to communicate uh, to some extent. And in particular in art, there's a lot of, I mean, of course, uh, in the perfect setting, visual art should deal with universal ideas that everybody can understand, but a lot of it is founded in culture. And what I found amazing about mathematics is that you uh, can communicate creative activity but so precisely, okay? So I, I uh, as an 18 year old, I was asked by my advisor to, um, to go visit a friend of his in, in Germany. And this was some old guy of 60 something. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? And within 10 minutes, we were excitedly discussing the beauty of a certain proof and so on. And I mean, this is what is amazing with mathematics that you can communicate precisely about creative experiences, I would say. So when I had a, I had a chair in the Netherlands, and at that time I had to give, they have this uh, uh, tradition that you have to give an orazi. And I, and I wrote this orati, it's available on the internet, where I try to explain this. But to give a, a short version, um, I think a main thing is exactly the fact that it is a creative process 
based on trying to understand something deeply. Okay, so it's driven by some kind of need or want to understand something um, and to express it. Um, and um, so one way you can see it is kind of in the motivations. I had a lot of friends when I was in, in, in graduate school that were artists. And we had very similar ways of talking about that you need to do it. You know, you, do, you don't choose this because it's glamorous or it makes you a lot of money or whatever. It's because you have to. Okay, so that's already, I think, an indication of a commonality. Um, mm. uh, another thing is that, that you get like breakthroughs, right? I think if you talk to mathematicians, you very often hear that you're stuck, you're stuck, you're stuck. And then without you doing anything, all of a sudden you know, you know how, what, what the answer is, how to do it. And I think this also happens for artists, right? So th there's some indications like that that show that it's similar. But of course, in terms of what you produce, it looks quite different, right? Because an artist tries to communicate in such a way that it is uh, accessible for everybody. Whereas in mathematics, we, we have a very precise language and it's only accessible if you know this language, and not only that, you work very hard to understand what it says, right? So it's, so it's kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of how you try to communicate uh, and what you can communicate. But I think in terms of the process and your, and your drive to do it, it's extremely similar. That's what I would say. Well, exactly, because the drive comes from a drive towards beauty, towards understanding, which is, what is understanding? It's something like, ah, now it all fits, right? And it's some kind of aesthetic, aesthetic uh, experience. I would also say, I mean, I've had a lot of, I've tried to do a lot of things to promote math among kids and among women and among, in lots of different situations and very often other mathematicians want to talk about, yes, math can make MP3s and it can make this and it can make a lot of things that we are very happy about in society. But this makes me very uncomfortable because as a mathematician, I'm not proving a theorem because it might be useful. I really don't care. I mean, okay, great, but in a way my, my drive is rather aesthetic or understanding or something like that that is much closer to the drive of a of an artist I would say well you know I'm I have spent my whole time doing mathematics I'm not a sociologist so this is always a problem you know it's like if you meet a giraffe in the zoo and you ask them what, what should you do for giraffe, they don't know anything about it, right? So uh, you should rather ask a zoologist or something like that. So I don't really know um, the answer to that. Um, but uh, at least one thing that's true in my case is that I'm much more driven by, uh, by, the, by mathematics as a humanity rather than as a science. This is, of course, not true about every woman mathematician. But I think there is some kind of idea of boys playing with radios or something like that. And, and, uh, uh, but I think it's important to know that there's also another access to mathematics, which is rather through philosophy or through language or through, you know, through something that's much more like a humanities endeavor. And that, that I think is one way to make it, make it accessible, at least, and interesting for a larger part of the population, whether it's men or women, but it might catch some women, <laughs> is what I would think. Well, getting to speak to each other is primordial, I would say. Um, uh, it's, 
I mean, this is, this is clear. We are, in a sense, very few, right? And so when we meet, I mean, we have our closest collaborators, our closest friends are, across, are like spread across the world. So when we meet, in a sense, like the CIRM, this is when we get to exchange ideas and, and listen to each other and see what, what we are doing. And that's extremely important. Um, Uh, again, also, like I was saying, this fact that, in a way, uh, a proof of a result is like a description of the path of the creative discovery. Okay? So it's like you don't just have a painting. You also have the process of how it was painted, you know, or not even just how it was painted, but what went on in the, in the painter's head. Okay? And uh, really sharing that is very, very important. Uh, and of course, we do write things down, and that is a trace of it. But it comes much more alive, and it's much easier to communicate if you can interact. So I think it's extremely important. Mm -hmm.